this church has proven to be a very generous church. As more and more people come in, I want those people who are brand new to experience and be blessed by that spirit of generosity. You'll never know or understand what God has in store for you until you have latched onto a vision and until you're generous with the funds that God gives you to fulfill it. We wanna give the good news of Jesus to everybody that we can find. What you're doing, your, your energy, your effort, your prayers uh, are being felt here because people are coming to know Christ here. Amen. Welcome to the hills. And whether you're watching online or at any of our campuses in Tarrant County, at West Fort Worth or at South Lake or at North Richmond Hills, thrilled that you are with us. Now, as you would expect, our online church family has grown remarkably this year. And what that means is a lot of you are hearing about harvest offering for the first time. So for years, what our church did in November was have a Sunday where we would collect monies to fund all of our international and national mission work for the following calendar year. Now, we haven't done that the last couple of years for a special reason. We gave $7.5 million toward mission efforts through our Courage offerings. Our Courage campaign is wrapping up this month. People are fulfilling the last of their pledges. So we're returning to our regular system this November 15th. We need $2.5 million. He said, that's a lot of money. Yeah, but it's doing a lot of things. It's going to support in 2021, 28 missionary families, 16 church plants, Livingstone International University, which is a Christian college in East Africa that we helped found, and many other good works. So that's what's going to happen. Be praying about that. It is a big deal, and we want you on board. Because 2021, I'm praying, is going to be a lot better year than 2020. Anybody here just kind of worn out by 2020? Now, you know that by nature, I'm not a pessimist. And whenever we start a new year, I enter that year with great hope and courage. In fact, I feel like this guy right here. I am going to enter that new year and I am ready to battle and I am ready to conquer and I am ready for challenge. But 2020 has felt more like this. <laughs> and it's just been a hard year for all of us. And I want you to know that for some of us, it was a hard year, even if there wasn't a pandemic. That's been true for my family. Primarily because of some very serious illness in my extended family. This would have been a hard year if there wasn't a virus. And I'm not the only one that could say that. And this year has confirmed three principles that over six decades of life have taught me. And the first is life is hard for everybody. And if you're pointing to someone and said, well, their life's a lot easier than my life. You don't know all the story about their life. Everyone's life has seasons that are extremely difficult. And that leads to the second thing I've learned, that the healthiest people are able to find joy and peace in the hard seasons rather than after them. That they don't have to get on the other side of the hard season to have peace and joy in their life. And the reason why, and this is the third thing I've learned, is that these people put their faith and their hope in something or someone that remains unchanging. Something that the hard season cannot change. And for us as Christians, that someone is I am. Not I was, not I might be. And so I'm reminded of a sentence I read years ago by a minister and writer named A.W. Tozer that has really impacted me for many years. He wrote, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And he is spot on. When you are in that hard season, when you're going through that tough year, the single most important thing is what do you think about God? And so I thought as this hard year comes to a close, what we need to do as a church is spend a few works, a weeks and think about God. So I'm going to take the chorus of a popular song and we're going to be reminded that our God is a way maker and a miracle worker and a promise keeper. He is our light in the darkness. Because again, what matters most 
is the way we think of God. So each week, I'm going to take a story from the Old Testament, and we're just going to think about God. And today, we're going to look at the story of the children of Israel leaving Egypt. Now, you talk about people that knew hard. The Hebrew slaves didn't know a year of hard. They knew centuries of hard. What they didn't know was how to think of God. And then one day, by a burning bush, God met Moses and introduced himself and said, I need you to go and say to Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses said, I can't do that. I don't have what it takes. I'm not enough. And God said, Moses, it doesn't matter who you are. What matters is who I am. God did not give Moses a pep talk. What God gave Moses was greater understanding, greater capacity to say, that is who you are. And so Moses went to Pharaoh and said, I am, says, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, I don't know your I am, but I know here in Egypt, I am Pharaoh. And so a match is set up. Between I am and I am Pharaoh. And it's pretty clear there's just going to be one winner. And you can read about this in the first chapters of Exodus. I got so thrilled reading it again, I decided that next year we're going to do a series and we're just going to look at the different ways that God delivers people out of bondage. But for right now, here's what happens. A match ensues. It's a 10-round match. And in every Round, God takes out a God that is supposed to be supporting I am Pharaoh. And we get to round 10, and God is going to go for the knockout. And what becomes clear, Moses is not the way maker. Moses is the voice for the way maker. And so Moses announces how the final round is going to go. He says to the people of Israel, you go take a lamb, not any lamb, uh-uh. You get a perfect lamb. You get a lamb with no defect. And you put the blood of that lamb on your house because God is going to pass through Egypt. And every house that is not covered by the blood of a perfect lamb is going to experience death. And that's what happens. And that next morning, the Egyptians are so ready for the children of Israel to leave. They start giving them their own treasures and saying, take this and just get out of here. And it says, look at uh, Exodus 13 with me. That when Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route to the promised land. God said, if the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness toward the Red Sea. So even though they've got all the equipment for war, they don't know how to use it. They're not equipped yet to go to war. And so God says, I am going to take out Pharaoh and I'm going to set up a battle where I do all the fighting. So now chapter 14. And then the Lord gave these instructions to Moses. Order the Israelites to turn back and camp by Pahiroth between Migdal and the sea. Camp there along the shore across from Baal Zephon. Then Pharaoh will think the Israelites are confused. They're trapped in the wilderness. And once again, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after you. Now watch this. This is very important. I've planned this in order to display my glory through Pharaoh. And his whole army. And after this, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites camped there as they were told. So here's what God did. For this final match, he had Israel march into what was basically a geographical cul-de-sac. On one side, there's mountains. And on the other side, there's wilderness. And then there's sea. I mean, they are basically trapped. From a military perspective, it was the worst possible place for the people to camp. So when Pharaoh said, that's what they've done, they're confused. They have no clue. They are sitting ducks. So he calls up the army. We're going to chase after them because they are hemmed in. 
They have no way of escape. Oh, but they have a way maker who welcomes impossibility as a way to display his glory. Now, here's what we're going to do. This story I'm about to read is referred to over and over and over in the Bible. Maybe one of the most referred to stories in all the Bible. It's big. So we're just going to read it. We're going to take the time it takes, and we're just going to read this amazing way that God made. It says, when the word reached the king of Egypt that the Israelites had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds. What have we done letting all these Israelite slaves get away? They asked. So Pharaoh harnessed his chariot and called up his troops. He took with him 600 of Egypt's best chariots along with the rest of the chariots of Egypt, each with its commander. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So he chased after the people of Israel who had left with fists raised in defiance. The Egyptians chased after them with all the forces in Pharaoh's army, all his horses and chariots, his charioteers and his troops. And the Egyptians caught up with the people of Israel as they were camped, now notice, beside the shore of Pihahiroth, across from Baal Zephon, exactly where God told them to go. They are trapped there. They are hemmed in. There is no way out. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, by the way, this is what people do when they're desperate. They cry to God and they blame people. And so they're going to blame Moses for this situation. Watch. Why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves in Egypt. I just got to stop. It's amazing how comfortable people get with slavery. It is amazing how used people get to bondage and just let bondage be normal. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. And then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Now, God's about to do something here. God is about to make a way no one, no one ever imagined. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they will charge in after the Israelites. And please notice, why is God doing it this way? Why this way? My great glory will be displayed through Pharaoh and his troops, his chariots, his charioteers. And when my glory is displayed through them, all Egypt will see my glory and they will know that I am the Lord. And then the angel of God, who had been leading the people of Israel, moved to the rear of the camp. And the pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind him. I got to stop a second. When you obey God and do what he says, he's got your back. Okay, that's a free sermon. The cloud settled between the Egyptians and Israelite camps. And as darkness fell, the cloud turned to fire, lighting up the night. But the Egyptians and Israelites did not approach each other all night. And then Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. Then the Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and charioteers, chased them into the middle of the sea. But just before dawn, the Lord looked down on the Egyptian army from the pillar of fire and cloud, and he threw their forces into total confusion. He twisted their chariot wheels, making their chariots difficult to drive. Let's get out of here. Away from these Israelites, the Egyptians shouted. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. And when all the Israelites had reached the other side, the Lord said to Moses, raise your hand over the sea again, and then the waters will rush back and cover the Egyptians and their chariots and charioteers. So as the sun began to rise, Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the water rushed back into its usual place. The Egyptians tried to escape, but the Lord swept them into the sea. 
Then the waters returned and covered all the chariots and charioteers, the entire army of Pharaoh. You know, somebody needs to make a movie about this. <laughs> Show it every year at Easter. Of all the Egyptians who would chase the Israelites into the sea, not a single one survived. But the people of Israel had walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground. As the water stood up like a wall on both sides, that is how the Lord rescued Israel from the hands of the Egyptians that day. Can somebody just say, Amen, God? You see, God doesn't commission and then abandon. So this is big. Whenever a believer, whenever a church, whenever a community of faith determines this is where God wants us to go, they can head that direction with boldness and confidence that He is going to guide them, He's going to empower them. And their pursuit of it. And even when it seems impossible, God will make a way. That is who you are. And we need to hear that right now. That God is going to make a way. That is what he does because that is who he is. Now, let's just lean into that a little bit. How does that help us practically? Here's the first big truth. We need to remember that one way God makes a way is to not let us go the way we want. It says that God didn't lead them along the main road, even though that was the shortest route. One of God's greatest graces to us is the detours he often makes us take. Because the truth is, we way overestimate our capacity to consistently choose the right way. Scripture even says in Proverbs 14, there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. How many of us can look back at times in our lives where the way we chose that we thought was right turned out to be the wrong way? So here's the thing you got to know. When you start walking with God, there are going to be times when the right place at the right time is going to feel like the wrong place at the wrong time. But ask any believer who has walked with God for a while, and they can tell you of times in their lives when they look back and say, God, now I see that I praise you for the detours. That you didn't let me go the way I wanted, and now I praise you because I see what you were doing. That's true in my life. <laughs> I praise God. He didn't let me marry every girl I had a crush on when I was 18. <laughs> Made me wait till I met Jamie. Or did you know that even though God called me as a young boy to be a preacher, I ran from that call for a long time. And when I graduated college, I tried to get a job in youth ministry because I felt inadequate. Now, youth ministry is a wonderful job, but that wasn't my calling. Every church I interviewed said the same thing. You are impeccably qualified and we're not going to hire you because you're single. True story. I finally went to one church to interview for the youth minister job. They said, we're not going to hire you because you're single, but we will let you be our preacher, which I've never totally understood. They didn't want me to be around their daughters, but they didn't care if I was around their wives. So that's how it all got started. God just kept putting detours in my path until I was on the road he wanted me on. And here's what I've learned. God isn't going to lead you to the easiest path. He's going to lead you to the path that is going to grow your faith the most. Which leads to the second truth I've learned. That another way God makes a way is by taking us through what we want to go around. You see, when you're walking with God and an obstacle is in the way, that isn't necessarily a sign that you are off course. God often calls us to what he wants us to go through. And that's because God can see a way to the other side when you still can't. Look with me at Psalm 77. Your road led through the sea, your pathway through the mighty waters, a pathway no one knew was there. God can see the path when you can't see it yet. And why does God do it this way? Because God knows the way through is going to lead you to greater dependence on him. So listen, for example, to Brother Paul, who was having a 2020 kind of year. He says in 2 Corinthians 1, 
We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. Why does God take you to the Red Sea? Because God knows you are never in more desperate shape in your life when you get to a place in life where you're stopped being desperate for God. And so God is going to make a way by taking you through what you want to go around. He's going to take you to the sea moment to grow your faith muscles. So what you're doing is you're praying, God, get me out of something I don't want to go through. And God answers, no, I'm going to take you through it so you'll get something out of it. There's a level of faith and growth and courage and strength I can't develop unless I take you through it. Uh, some of you are familiar with the author of Malcolm Gladwell. He had a book several years ago called David and Goliath where he studied how people overcome great odds to achieve some level of success. He said uh, there was a study by City University in London of many very, very successful people. And the stunning thing they found, an overwhelming number of them had learning disabilities. And Gladwell says, you got to come up with only two explanations, either they were so smart and they were so creative, they just overcame their disability. Or, he said, more likely, that disability caused them to develop strengths and capacities and skills that blessed them and helped them achieve success. And so Paul says, God, I hate this thorn. I don't want to go through this anymore. Take it away. And God says, Paul, I'm not going to take you around it. I'm going to take you through it. Because in the midst of it, you experience a depth of my sustaining grace you would never understand if I took you around it. God doesn't give you grace instead of trials. God gives you grace in the midst of trials. And this is why, think with me, when you are going through it and life got hard, the thing that inspires you most are people who have through it testimonies. Now, do you have an around testimony? Praise God. They found a spot on my lung and we prayed and we went back to the doctor and they took another x-ray and the spot was gone. Praise God. He took you around it. Thank somebody. But the truth is when I'm in the middle of it and it's really tough, you know who I want to talk to? I want to talk to the person that went through the cancer, through the hard marriage, through the addiction, through the family crisis. That's the testimony that is going to inspire me the most. So don't be resentful. When God takes you to something you don't see a way through. Because, and this is big, any way God makes is for his glory and for our good. See, God doesn't just make the best way. God makes the way that is for our best. It's not the way that's going to let us just temporarily escape our captivity. It's the way that is going to drown forever our identity as slaves. Put on your seatbelt. I'm about to start preaching. Why did he take them through the sea and not around it? Because if they went around it, they'd have constantly looked over their shoulders. When are the Egyptians coming? And their identity would have forever been, we're just a bunch of runaway slaves. God says, I don't want you to experience just temporary relief from your bondage. I want it to be drowned. I want you to be a new creation. I want breakthrough. I want freedom. I want the enemy that has pursued you to be gone forever. That's what I'm about. That's why we're going through it. In Babylon, the people were in captivity again centuries later. And Isaiah says, this is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sakes, I'll send an army against Babylon, forcing the Babylonians to flee in those ships. They're so proud of I'm the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator and king. I'm the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. God says, I know how to get people out of captivity. I've done it once. I can do it again. But remember, when God makes a way for us, it's not just about us. Over and over, we read God saying, I am going to display my glory. I'm going to make the way that puts my glory most on 
display. And so when Pharaoh said, who is this Lord that I should listen to him? God says, I'll take that challenge. And I'm going to answer your question in a way that not just you, but many will understand. In fact, 40 years later, when the children of Israel got to the banks of the Jordan, it says the Canaanites were trembling in fear because they had heard about their God and what he had done at the Red Sea. Again, Isaiah chapter 63. Then they remembered those days of old when Moses led his people out of Egypt. They cried out, where's the one who brought Israel through the sea with Moses as their shepherd? Where's the one who sent his Holy Spirit to be among his people? You led your people, Lord, and gained a magnificent reputation. And so here's what that means. That means God is going to make a way for you to put his glory on display. Because God is more concerned about others witnessing his glory than he is about what way would give you the most comfort. Is that okay with you? Is it okay with you if God makes a way that isn't the easiest for you, but is the best for the reputation of God? Remember that God wants to make a way for the sake of people beyond the people he's making the way for. Let me say that again. When God makes a way for you, he wants to make a way that is going to bless people beyond the way he made for you. I want to show you this picture. One of the greatest of all Americans. Her name was Harriet Tubman. Born in 1822 on a plantation in Maryland. Endured a brutish and horrific young life as a slave. Saw three of her brothers sold and never saw them again at age 26 She was about to get sold, and she ran away. Through the Underground Railroad, she made it all the way to Pennsylvania and a life of freedom. And she knew God had made that way. And she also knew God had made that way for the sake of others. The next eight years, she went back time and time again, and she freed scores and scores of slaves. No GPS, no compass, walking at night, no clue. And she said, "'Twasn't me, t'was the Lord.'" I just said, Lord, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do, but I am trusting in you. And God always told me where to go. In fact, uh, noted abolitionist Thomas Garrett said, I have never known a person of any color who heard the voice of God more clearly and obeyed it like Harriet Tubman. Because here's the thing. You never have to wonder if God is going to make a way for people who are desperate to be delivered. In fact, he already has. You see, the only way to freedom is the way made by God. Throughout the story of the Red Sea, God's way of salvation is depicted as you stand still and watch what God can do. Salvation is God doing for you. God making a way for you that you cannot make. Stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. See, this is the difference between the Christian faith and the other religions of the world. Every religion has a way to God. And you make the way by building the ladder and they give you the rules for the ladder. If you're an old school rocker, you've heard the name of Sammy Hagar, great guitarist. He was asked in an interview what he thought of Jesus Christ. He said, greatest person who ever lived. Oh, so you think he's the way, the truth, the life? No, no, no. Jesus didn't believe that. Jesus wasn't saying, I'm your savior. Jesus just came and said, hey, listen, be good. You know, the Ten Commandments are simple. Just do that. Well, first off, Sammy didn't read the Gospels. But second, Sammy can't do that. You can't do that. I can't do that. Ten Commandments aren't hard to understand. They're hard to keep. You ever lied? You ever coveted? You ever put anything in front of God? That is not the way to God. And if you choose that way, the enemy is constantly behind you, chasing you and reminding you, you are a slave. The way to God is made possible by the blood of a perfect lamb. Only God could make this way. And so the scripture says in Hebrews, so brothers and sisters, we are completely free. Don't you like those two words? We are completely free. 
to enter the most holy place without fear because of the blood of Jesus' death. We can enter through a new and living way that Jesus opened for us. Jesus didn't say, I'll show you a way. He didn't say, I know about a way. Jesus said, I am the way. And you're never going to lose your identity as a slave until you trust the way he has made. So uh, last spring, shortly after the pandemic got to the place that we had to shut down all of our services and everything was online. And you might recall I was preaching through the book of Galatians. I got an email from a family in our church. They were watching at home and with them was their mother who was in hospice care near death, who had lived her whole life in a system that you have to make your own way to God. You better be good enough. And here she was facing death with great fear that she had not done enough for God. So they turned on the TV. She was in her bed and and her eyes were closed. They assumed she was just asleep. And I preached about the gospel of grace about a God who sent his perfect son to take your place, to take your judgment. Stand still and let the Lord fight for you today. And when the sermon was over, they noticed tears on her cheeks and she simply said, is that true? And they were able to pray over her and help her receive peace. See, God's way is not for you to go around judgment. God's way is for you to go through judgment covered in the blood of Christ. It's a path to freedom only I am could make. And he did. My God, that is who you are. Hard year, isn't it? Some of you right now are in a tough place. And the most important thing, what do you think of God? Gladys Howard was a missionary 75 years ago in China just before World War II. She had this orphanage. The Japanese invaded. She had to get all these kids over the mountains to a safe place in China. She wrote how exhausted she was, how helpless and inadequate she felt. At one point on the journey, she said, I can't do this. And the 13-year-old orphan girl said, Miss Gladys, remember how you always told us a story about Moses and the Red Sea? And Gladys said, yeah, but I'm not Moses. And that little girl said, yes, but Jehovah is still God. I am still is. And so, where do you need God to make a way for you? I want us to pray together. Go ahead and bow your heads. Here's what I want you to do first. I want you to identify and speak to the Lord. I want you to name something right now in your life where you just feel kind of stuck, where you feel trapped, where you don't see a way. Just go ahead and actually name it and give it to the Lord. Okay, and now this is very important. I think you need to do this. I think you need to speak to the Lord and say to him, I believe you can make a way. And I'm okay that the way you make is hard if it brings you great glory. I want you right now to tell the Lord, your glory, that's the way I want So God, in the powerful name of Jesus, we declare that you are the way maker. There is no bondage. There is no captor. There is no trap that you cannot free us from. And not just temporarily, God, you can change our identity and make us new creations who walk in liberation and not in fear. And so God, we declare that you 
will make a way. We may not can see it yet. It might be a way only you can see. But we declare in faith and we thank you in advance for the way you will make and the way you will glorify your name and bring about what is for our good. And through Jesus, we declare this. Amen.